David, usually tonight I'm doing my radio show. Right. And I took the night off because when something's important, you just have to like step up <laughs> and you have to put the things you like to do aside for, for what you have to do. Right. And I have to tell people about something important, which is prog rock. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So. so, yes. So at some point in life, I don't know if you have any work experience with this, of people doing the right thing or the wrong thing. I'm trying to do the right thing and talk to you and them about your book, The Show That Never Ends. Thank you. So... I, you, you, uh, what, what, what got you into this music, first of all? What was the entry point for you? Yeah, I, I fell backwards into it from heavy metal. I was, I was 14 or 15, uh, fairly nerdy like I am now, uh, probably more uh, athletic than I am now, but still not good, and just listened to music all the time. Uh, but like, was going down a heavy Metallica Iron Maiden route, and then I was reading this uh, online critic, Mark Prindle, it just using a clicky you know, modem in, in 1996 who liked that plus yes, and I found yes tapes at a outlet store at, near the Delaware beaches like with you know, the, the dust on them, clearly indicating they were trying to get rid of them. And just kept, I remember the first moments of uh, Roundabout on Fragile and kept going from there. But uh, in the back of my mind, once I realized there were no books about this, narrative books, like there were, there were really good books that go into the music. Once there wasn't a big a story, I thought, well, one day, possibly I'll write about this, but who knows? Yeah, so... But even then, like 20, 15 years ago. Yeah, it's funny how people get into it. Um, I remember, like, because when I was a, a young boy, I would buy records because I didn't get know what they sounded like. Yeah. And that's because you would just have to buy them before the internet. You had to just buy stuff and you just eat shit regularly on how bad <laughs> things were but um i had my christmas money and i rode my bike to the record store and i bought a uh, a rolling stones uh let's spend the night together live concert vhs tape um i bought a frankie goes to hollywood 12 inch mm -hmm. and i bought uh the Emerson, Lake, and Palmer uh, live album, the three LP, Welcome Back, My Friends, to the show that never ends. So that was, I must have, I can only think of the message I was sending to people <laughs> at that point in my life. A very confused young person. Not I, sure I, what I was buying in. cassettes, so the art wasn't even looking good. It was like a grainy reproduction about this big of the Roger Dean planet painting on these things. I couldn't even <laughs> well, make yeah. that excuse. What an inspiring thing to sit back, relax, <laughs> and try to focus your eyes on a planetary landscape <laughs> that's three inches by two <laughs> inches. So, so that's, that got you into it. Yeah. And what, what kind of expanded out? And when, did you, when were you aware that right. this is prog rock and this, this is a, a thing unto itself? It's a, it's a good question because it's more elastic than a lot of music terms. I mean, there, there are tons of Venn diagrams and big, broad genre placements. And progressive rock is basically stuff that grew out of psychedelia and, and, and freak beat in, in, in London, incorporated experimental music and classical music. So I, 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 I've met a lot of people who love jam bands. I really I kind of don't. But I see how that, that's the other... That's the other, like it's the Neanderthal on the on the evolution tree. This is the Cro-Magnon. They're they're like they share lots of qualities, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but the progressive was, and I, some of the people I quote in the book are pretty open about how look we this is from England, a country where we kind of imported some, uh, like black R and B and rock music, but where we all went to Anglican church with big hymns. We all had classical training. The music we came, once we kind of got away from ripping off the Who, what we decided was interesting was much more influenced by Brahms and by hymns and then by people like, uh, like Harry Parch, guys like making their instruments and banging them together. Like once they discovered synthesizers, that's what they were basically doing. Yeah, and, and that is its own thing, guys who were not because it's, it's such a European thing, yeah, prog rock, and uh, it's people who just realized, and uh, it's, such a, it's such a sketchy area, too, when you think yeah. about, because then you start getting into scary things when you talk about what music is meant for what people, <laughs> and, but that was <laughs> that not... That came up a couple of times as I reported it, yeah, but it was, they influ it all influenced them, and it's also, 
I found progressive rock insanely popular in Japan. I missed, I finally went to Japan and was going to see the Wax Museum of Progressive Rock, which I learned had closed down like six months earlier. And I was, I don't know if, if anyone here has well, we need to a, slow open down space in some wax museums. <laughs> The Wax Museum of Progressive Rock. That's right. There was right. only one. It was in Tokyo. There were, but, I yeah. can say right now there will be no Q&A section tonight. <laughs> we're just going to be talking about the Wax Museum of Progressive Rock <laughs> in Tokyo. So, so it's a wax. I'm assuming it's a wax museum. It was. It was. It's defunct now. So, so somewhere someone was taking like a, a Steve Howe <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wax figure and throwing it into what a like a mel a big pot and <laughs> melting it down. Is that what I don't know what happens to to wax museums that they they end in their natural life. I just like to assume they sell them off like the seats at stadiums that break oh. <laughs> they break yeah. down. Oh. There's really? somebody with like a Robert Fripp that they've posed mm -hmm. yeah. in their in their favorite uh, sit down position. Yeah, some or, somewhere in Nagoya Province. Yeah, or they just like take the head off of <laughs> Rick Wakeman and put like here's. Billy Joe Armstrong's head <laughs> is now going on. Take the cape off, put some tattoos on the arm. But uh, just learning about that, I realized like I, I learned over time through the internet. The internet like was growing up as I was basically. It went from not many sites to infinite number, lots of fan sites and lots of fan boards, and I was on them. And people were kept trading and finding stranger and stranger stuff. But not strange bad. We weren't like assaulting ourselves with this. I would play it for people, and Find, like find really strong melodies and musical experiments that I just thought were more interesting than kind of anything like this lasted for a decade. I, my other musical taste has gone in and out for various bands over the years. I've never given up how interesting I find King Crimson. And so neither has Japan, mm -hmm. apart from the wax part. Yeah. So, so just in conclusion with yeah. the Prague Rock <laughs> Wax Museum, you struck out. Yes. There wasn't like any... <laughs> remnants laying around like a hand they changed it to i think some kind of video game exhibit which, okay. which might be telling it was another music exhibit mm -hmm. yeah so the love of the music is one thing but then yeah. saying that there's a book here yeah is another thing it's it's funny when you think about this music where in the scheme of things punk rock has not sold the amount of records that prog rock has sold even by like a drop in the bucket for yeah. it but the amount of documenting and and discussing and writing about punk is is so uh, so it's a, you couldn't even compare there's hardly anything mm -hmm. about prog written so what, what what do you think that's about and what made you decide hey i'm gonna buck the trend here and throw my hat in the ring well I, th this narrative about rock built up over the over decades and again i i born 1981 and when i started Getting into this, the accepted history was that uh, music was good for a while in the 60s, then it was terrible and punk saved it, uh, and then it was, it was bad again. I mean, rock was kind of petering out in terms of the dominant force in music. And I, I, in general, like I mostly cover politics for my day job and have for years. In general, when, that, when there is a clear storyline, I say, is that, is that right? And the, because I like this music so much, I would listen to it and say, I, I'm hearing Keith Emerson do things with the Moog synthesizer around the same time as Stevie Wonder. I'm hearing people developing, like, you know, buying the new editions of Japanese things before Depeche Mode came along. I'm, I'm also interested if, if Prague rebelled against, sorry, Punk rebelled against something, what are you rebelling against? If you're interested in anything, you're interested in what and why, why it was created. Uh, and then I, I kind of, my, my test for this was uh, Slate, my, my former boss, David Plotz, is here. I'm very glad to see him. Um, Slate had a uh, tradition which I think has mostly survived, although I might have broken it, where every year if you, you, write, you take a month and write about something you don't normally write about. So in 2012, I say, I, I want to do this. I just want to, I think it's interesting. I think there, it'd be fun to report out, and I want to see if people like it. And um, yeah, all three of those happened. That's what I could, what I could tell. Um, so, so it ran from there, and then I, I, I kind of noticed as I was writing, I was kind of worried that I might be falling short on the trend because there were a few other books that came out, some criti critical hot takes trying to argue whether it was good or not, but there wasn't a story the way there is, the way there is great books about punk, the way there are great books about Birth of Hip Hop, the, a million books about the Beatles, there wasn't one that was just here is the, how these guys made the, mu made the music with like both theory and with Spinal Tap stories. Mm -hmm. 
So, so to take on something that big and yeah. fit it into one reasonably sized book. Yeah. Because look, I personally, I wish the book was seven thousand pages long, <laughs> and that you were set, and then at the last page it said, "To be continued in volume two. This only took us up to 1970." Yeah. Because it's the great, it's the characters in this music yeah. are some of the most colorful and hilarious people that have ever made music. It's, yeah. They're really, they're, they're, they're truly larger than life. That's why I couldn't believe they were left out. Because, I mean, in, in punk, and I like it, but in order to be a legend in punk, you need to, like, cut yourself a couple times, and boom. Like, then there's, like, a, there's a biopic, and, you know, Zac Efron plays you, I assume, when he wants to go for the Oscar. And in this, you have... I mean, you were already kind of talking about Rick Wakeman, who is this completely naturally uh, virtuoso piano talent, knows it, um, kind of, and is hyper aware of how ridiculous progressive rock can be, so leans in um, both into like making, for example, uh, several several adaptations of, of stories like the, the Wise Hammer the Eighth makes a. Uh, Nights at the Round Table ice show with his own music, and also makes fun constantly of what Yes is playing to the extent where when the Tales of Topographic Oceans, this double album that I'll defend, but, but not a lot of people defend, uh, is being toured, he's so bored he just orders dinner during the part he's not playing. Uh, and also wears capes. I left to the end that he constantly wears capes, just, just, just for fun. And, and uh, I don't know where where were the cape. Well, the New York Dolls had like lipstick and stuff, so good for them. But this so is like cape-centric music. So on one hand, you're smashing. Somebody can smash yeah. a beer bottle on their own forehead. Yeah. On the other hand, you have a guy taking his show. Yeah. And sa and finding out. Well, the arena is has an ice skating thing going on. So I don't know if we could do the show the way you want to. So he's like, eh, we'll put my show on ice also. <laughs> so he is King Arthur. Yeah. Suddenly he just like. Like which that's that's truly one of the craziest yeah. things ever, and he's one of those guys who he's he you could tell he wholeheartedly believes in the music he's playing, mm -hmm. but he also knows what's funny about it. Yeah, and he knows how ridiculous the all the spectacle is, and he it's like he's in on the joke with mm -hmm. it. Conversely, there's guys who w less so were mm -hmm. in on the joke, like like Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Um, it seems like they truly took themselves so seriously yeah. with with what they were doing. Absolutely. And there are three individuals with, I think, different levels of how seriously they took themselves. Keith Emerson, the other keyword virtuoso, who, if we're talking about, like, theatrics, was established himself early on by taking it, uh, knives, which were supplied by Lemmy, who went on to be in Hawkwind, who went on to be in Motorhead, who also collected Nazi memorabilia. So these were like Saving Private Ryan Nazi dives that he was using to stick between the keyboards of his Hammond organ and climb over it and insult it, who also wanted to write serious symphonic music. Um, and th then there was Greg Lake, who was like a big, brash rock star, who but had pretensions of seriousness. Then there's Carl Palmer, I think, is just kind of happy to get along. But through their career, like Emerson is finding classical pieces for them to adapt. Uh, they do Mussorgsky's um, Pictures at Exhibition. He writes... Uh, the, a piece, you know, a, a, a symphonic piece that's that's in the works of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Uh, <laughs> called that one because it sounds good. That's the works of this band. Uh, also called that because at the time he was getting cocaine sent to him in boxes labeled the complete works of Brahms or the complete works of Fox, uh -huh. <laughs> and thought it was a good idea. Um, but like with over once progressive rock gets kind of kicked out by critics and labels in the late 70s, I mean, he's still writing classical pieces without a big audience, and he kills himself uh, not that long ago, just, just last year. Um, and I had talked to him not, not that recently before he died, but he's, it's very clear from what happened to him that both his, his technique was fading because of, um, be, because of just, just injuries and degradation, and also no one was listening to what he wanted to write. Wow. So yeah. he, yeah, because I know he took it very personally that he couldn't play what he used to yeah. be able to play. I mean, you'd watch these these, vid these videos that I, I went and saw the concerts, and you see just between everything, he is playing complete, complicated 20-minute pieces and between everything, re massaging and getting cortisone shots, et cetera, to, to keep it going. And not just that, but no one seems to appreciate it. So, the, so, the, so with prog rock, yeah. 
the, the, the prime movers, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, King Crimson, Genesis. Mm-hmm. Are, are we, are we, what are we, Jethro Tull, right? We'll go, yeah, we'll go yes. Well, I, yes. I put Soft Machine in there. Sure. Who I think, or the, the Edge, I put, I put Gong, who are mm-hmm. kind of, Soft Machine, the Edge that gets into Fusion, Gong that's the purest psychedelia that were like 1967 in Mallorca never ended. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd say those are the ones. And then uh, w- the book gets into Rush and it gets into some, some Kansas and some of the, uh, the, uh, the, Amer- of the American continent bands, I guess, to, to get them all in. It gets into PFM and Banco and the Italian groups and to Vangelis. Um, among Vangelis ends up being one of the most successful guys just through the movie themes once he goes away, uh, away from this. But yeah, it's, it's, it's most, it's, it is mostly English and no one takes quite the same path. There are a couple of bands that still exist. I mean, Yes still exists as a band that is, has no original members in it. Uh, some who were in the, the, early, the lineups early, yeah. that made the classic. King Crimson exists as something Robert Fripp just keeps reconstituting with the musicians he likes writing different music. It's still called that. Uh, and again, totally within the same genre, somebody who loves blowing up everything he did before and people who just want to be playing the, the, the hits for the crowd to fill the arena. And he's such an interesting guy because... Robert Fripp. Yeah, yeah, Robert Fripp because you can say that that first King Crimson album is, is maybe the, the first big statement in this genre of mm-hmm. music. But almost as soon as it started and he was in it, he was already kind of kicking at it yeah. and, and starting to try to change it. And he kind of blew his own band up in what, 1974? 74, yeah. Yeah. So, they're still huge. I mean, they're, they're not fl- flagging at all. Mm-hmm. A couple things, I want to get back to Robert Fripp, but I think you talk about this music that, that ostensibly the biggest bands were all British bands, except for yeah, these, like, Kansas and mm-hmm. Styx were, I mean, I don't know. what What is, is that really? <laughs> they, no, they, wrong, wrong. they took their cues from it first, and then they changed. There's not a ton of them in the book. I mean, the book does focus more on the bands that innovated and uh, it, it ends with kind of Dream Theater and Porcupine Tree and the progressive metal. Mm-hmm. But most of it's about the English guys. And everyone, I think, if you, if you like, truth serumed, yeah. um, Kenny Lanier, he's like, yes, of course. Uh, but even uh, Getty Lee and those guys, Rush, are pretty blatant that, that yeah. they were taking cues from these guys. But why do they sound so dumber than, <laughs> than the British bands? Like, why, why are they just markedly dumber? Uh, I, just, just that little gap in the generation and the, and the gap in the scene, uh, I, I think because their influences included these bands, they were sort of running them through a, through a Xerox. They also had more, more heavy rock influences. They were more influenced by Led Zeppelin, too, which these bands were not. They were contemporaries of Led Zeppelin. They're frankly like a lot of the trappings of Led Zeppelin, the fantasy stuff is, is imprinted on these guys, even though King Crimson had very little to do with it. They had maybe had some evil imagery, but nothing, nothing fantasy-wise. No, whereas the British bands, they, they created the form and then kept, tweak it, kept tweaking it, getting... Well, they, I give them credit, they all got bored with what they... The la- with very few exceptions, they got bored with what they just did and, and tried to change the sound. They weren't trying to make, like, progressive... Progressive meant something. They actually were changing the music as they went along. Yeah. How do you, how do you explain how huge this was in yeah. America when, when on paper, the, yeah. the, the, it, it would seem like something that America would just be like... This is not for us. It was an, an, not just enormous, but for all of the, the retellings of what punk was like, punk never really broke that big here as a mass culture. Obviously, some, th- just because something becomes mass popular, that doesn't mean it's that influential. But this this was, and when it was at its height, uh, bands could sell out the Veterans Stadium in Philly for a couple of shows. ELP could anchor California Jam and have four hundred thousand people. Uh, over over a, over a weekend, they were like not just festival anchoring bands, but ELP would uh, have residences at Mahasic Square Garden, and they had to innovate a lot of what arena rock was, at least in terms of the sound and the blocking, because they were it was kind of them and the Rolling Stones and a few other gigantic bands, much bigger than a lot of what came on and replaced them. And that's the the weird thing. The book does do a lot with um, the rock media and the rock industry, because it was like fairly conscious choice to knock this aside and fans were not really going along with them. I mean, yes, we're making music into the 80s before they reconstituted as more of a pop band and selling bigger, you know, selling as much as The Clash were bigger at their at their height. So they had the, they had the fandom and the fandom kind of was pretty sticky too. It kept showing up. Mm-hmm. 
but what what do you think makes some like mm-hmm. midwestern kid yeah to have this music speak to him which is which he, they have no reference for classical music yeah no reference for what the band is pulling from what these bands are pulling from the, as like the the core of what uh, what some of them are about yeah when I, when i started i, I talked about uh, how I got into it, but when I started writing the book, seriously, this, the Slate series and the book, I, I kind of just talked to fans who had been there for the creation, pretty easy to find online, just poke around. I went to festival, I went on a cruise, and it wasn't like a intentional survey, but I, I, I found just, there. I guess there were fewer distractions with the time they were growing up. In the late 60s and the 70s and to extent the 80s, um, there was a, a clear scene that you could join if, in this music uh, at the live festivals. There was not the competition from, you know, just video games. There's not as easy to, as easy to access, like sports on, on TV whenever you wanted it. Um, and just there was a bi- bigger mass rock scene, a uh, bigger market for it because there was, there was less going on. That's, like not, that's not a patch on it. Uh, and that, that's also why it's strange that there was such a heel turn by the music press, although... I, but those kids yeah. aren't the music press. Yeah. Like, like the British music press has no bearing no. on the seventy thousand f- people showing up to see <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I mean, in ping, America, ping pong here and the, the the album radio here was taking some cues from that. They were tr- trading back and forth. I mean, going but to write the book, I I read uh, every I believe probably every unless there's one missing from the libraries I went to. Every issue of like Sounds, Music Express, Cream, Circus. I mean, Circus kind of Circus really went in hard on this stuff, and then and then became more focused on on metal, uh, and they were really diligently reporting the scene. So that stuff got around. But when it came to be a, a mass, uh, it was interesting going back to just coverage in like the New York Times when ELP would come to town. It was a gi- gigantic event. I'd say you know, comparable to like bigger than like when when a Kanye West tour happens. Well, you know you're going to see a spectacle. You know you're going to see at one point an orchestra touring with the band. Because Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. They're rolling into town. Yeah. The first thing that comes down the road is a tractor trailer, yeah. and on the roof of it is the letter E. <laughs> <laughs> and then here comes a second tractor trailer, right? Yeah. And there's an L on the roof of that one, and then the third one has a P on it. Yeah. They were just like, they were, it yeah. was so, the spectacle was so insane with what they were doing. Yeah. They had the orchestra. The one tour where Which they bankrupted they, them, but they had yeah. it. I mean, like if you caught them on that side of the tour, yes. Yeah, and what's the story with Carl Palmer's drum set being heavy? <laughs> well, not not just heavy, but I mean, like they they developed the technology for it to rotate. They had a special special carpet for Greg Lake to perform on top of. Uh, they had, I mean, each night too. It's. I, again, growing up in like a, in a bit of a more traditional, not traditional, but a, a more homegrown rock scene where my band, I'd go to see a band, they all have four, four t-shirts, they're playing three-minute songs. Um, just watching videos of this stuff, of, you'd see Keith Emerson climbing over a gigantic piece of machinery and twisting knobs and f- forming sounds out of it. And he was not the only musician doing that, but he was the one doing it in arena. It was, it was just as a show, as a spectacle, like... I think as as good as anything you could see in live music. Yeah, do you, it just and and it's. I'm sorry if I'm caught up on this, but the idea of like an, yeah. a, a football stadium full of kids watching three guys play like like Aaron Copeland yeah. songs <laughs> for 20 minutes at a time, and everybody's like losing their marbles. I, it's just like it's such a hard thing to yeah. to d- digest. I guess the closest thing is the the. The Christmas thing, what, the Trans Siberian Orchestra. Yeah, which I is guess. not not in the book, and not even not even as an aesthetic choice. I just mm. kind of as I went around the fans, that that there wasn't much overlap. But there, I think that's there's like a muscle memory that pop culture has that this stuff is kind of fun, yeah. and that that where that fills into. Um, but but no, I mean like Keith Emerson would start would twist the knobs and be the start uh, the first notes of Hoedown by Aaron Copeland, and people would lose their minds. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think that this music, like what, what I, I personally feel, you know, you have people say why it was popular, this. It's like kids are smoking pot, <laughs> kids are like doing mushrooms, 
and it's like, do you want a three-minute song or a 22-minute song <laughs> that the album cover is of a planet yeah. to look at, like, and you don't have to get up and flip the record <laughs> over? I mean, that, that was part of it. I was surprised when I interviewed band members who have like, nothing to lose, and they've given a ton of interviews. Not that much in the way of drugs, like a lot more beer, liquor and beer and all that, and then later cocaine. But the, for the fans, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was just in interviewing people. And then also when I went to these concerts myself, if there's an open air yes show, immediately, like plumes of smoke around you uh, with you know, like great brazenness. You see that at hip, -hop, at hip hop stuff too, but like you are, you are there so that this extremely complicated music is filtering into your senses in, in, in an enhanced way. And yeah, how do you, how do you replicate that without something as... as dynamic and multi-part and complicated is what Yes is putting together, or Genesis is, or yeah. Peter Gabriel walking across the stage in various costumes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then some people would say it's like baseball, yeah. where you have to be <laughs> drunk to enjoy it. <laughs> it's like, but it's, it's not like that. I think it was an enhancing experience. Yeah. When you, when you get to that crux of 77, 78, and this other, mu and this scene has been around now for six, seven, eight years. A lot of these bands have been doing it. And the wheels are starting to come off on some of the bands. Mm -hmm. But then you have this other, tr other trends kind of showing up. What were the, the, the people you talked to, what, what is their take on that, that changing of the guard? Well, there are, again, there are a couple of different theories of it. I think Robert Fripp is pretty comfortable. Uh, with with all this music exploding, I mean, he had left into seclusion. Basically, was meditating and fi finding himself for a couple of years. Then came back. Uh, he and Peter Gabriel and a couple other musicians are in New York, um, feeding off that scene. I mean, I'm not trying to like minimize punk, just trying to put it in its, its role. But then there are people like Greg Lake who really think the music industry just just turned. It just it they made the wrong bet. They bet on this pop this pop culture that was just not, it was totally effervescent, not that popular. And again, reading these magazines, you see it turn so that even the magazine's logos and type typefaces go from clean to looking like spray paint. Like there was a, by Virgin and Harvest and all these labels, they kind of, they kind of bailed on it. Although I'm not sure how long any kind of trend in music lasts, even, even fairly straightforward pop rock. There's not, Springsteen got waxes and wanes and comes back. There's the, this. I don't know how much longer one would have expected people to continue listening to Yes as as Yes. But the other thing I found fun that's fun about talking to these people. Some of them are very honest about the wisdom of selling out and how you sell out in the 80s. They, I mean, Keith Emerson was going to do a solo album and did it with ELP because the label said you'll sell more. And okay, fine, they did. Asia forms because a bunch of different uh, refugees from bands that had fallen apart. Are can talk to, by the label into, into forming a supergroup. Same thing with Yes, the, they're 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 mashed together and uh, like the profit. It's I think both like their taste change and also the profit motive is, is a real thing. Genesis too, when they when they turn to a pop band, which is what they're most famous for. I talked to some not it was not just they're not just in the book, but you know Steve Hackett, who the guitarist who left right before they broke, is very honest about how yeah they made a decision to become popular. It's not that hard if you actually have a label willing to to back it, and so. That was interesting because it, it is a choice you make to, to be mm -hmm. extremely complicated and to try something new with every album. It's a, it's a choice you make to sell lots of records. Yeah, it's funny with, with Genesis when you think of those are kids mm -hmm. who kind of all came up together yeah. at, at private school. And, but their roots are just like, you know, they, they grew up with the Beatles just like yeah. everybody else. And then they kind of did this other thing and then Peter Gabriel splits, and then it's this, I guess it's this conscious thing to kind of edge it back to maybe what they grew up on a lot more than to keep going down some road with it. Yeah, I mean, some of that was. I mean, Robert Wyatt uh, from Soft Machine, well, he, he's, he uh, is injured and uh, loses the use of his legs, comes back with a cover of uh, I'm the Believer by the Monkees, and is very adamant that it's, he th it's easier to noodle around with, like, with like fu fusion uh, jazz it flavored music than it is to write a solid pop song. So th they, some of them just some of them made that choice. And then there are people like Robert Fripp who it wasn't like pop he was making. It was just being incredibly bored with everything he had done right before that and, and 
bring in something new. I mean, disco influenced records with David Byrne just repeating the names of philosophies over, over his looping guitar track. He was Robert Fripp ends King Crimson, mm -hmm. goes on a, a spiritual journey for yeah. a couple of years, and then moves downtown New York. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of and this is the thing that I, I I feel with so much of this. It's not it's not everything's not in a neat box. It's it is just like a smear. It is there is a spectrum to things, but the music all smears into each other. Mm -hmm. Where he's now he's playing on Peter Gabriel records, then he's playing on David Bowie records, and then he's he's producing people. He's producing the Roaches, and he's just like. And, and Hall and & Oates for and Hall, one point, yes, yeah. He, he did the Daryl Hall album. Mm -hmm. It's one of the greatest albums ever. That <laughs> album. But they wouldn't put it out for a year. It's out now, though. You can get it. It's you been can. out for 38 years now. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not crying about something you can't get. No, but, but that's um, what I wanted to convey is the creativity because I felt like the way they were portrayed in pop culture were the guys... I've talked about selling out before. They were not selling out. This was the music they wanted to make. It was super creative. Uh, and... It had the same rebellious spirit, kind of more of it than you, especially with some band like the Sex Pistols that are pretty prefabricated, um, that we celebrate in the music that destroyed it. So I just, I really wanted to convey by talking to these guys, telling the story, like this was radical, transformative music, and it was incredibly popular. Mm -hmm. Who who else did you? speak to in the in the course of putting this book together uh todd rundgren was really fun to talk to because i in the in the american chapter uh he makes just a conscious decision to become a progressive rock musician for like 19 months and then gets oh. bored with it uh but describing just the uh the how one put on a progressive rock stage show as opposed to the the normal the band utopia that he formed to do this uh and it's very, it's uh, lots of things melt with hot lights. Um, <laughs> lots of uh, the audience would be confusing the audience. He thought it was a good thing by bringing on Utopia to do like the progressive thing, and then putting on new outfits to do something pop. Uh, Adrian Ballou also just talking about uh, like just the, Frank Zappa's in the book through mostly throughout these other groups, but uh, talking about the com like the compositional tricks that we learned from people that were not like fronted a lot. I, I talked about a lot of the, the music writing this. It was really good. I mean, the, the journalists of these, of these times were kind of able to embed with people and talk through, through the, the making of the record. But they almost like, didn't, with a couple exceptions, like, they didn't brag about the, how much technique and craft went into stuff. And especially if you listen to, to, to Zappa, you can hear it. Uh, but he, like a lot of these people, leads with like the goofiness. He leads with you know, yeah. songs with set scatological songs mm -hmm. and yeah, toilet music. Yeah, basically toilet lyrics. Yeah, right. Why would the he's gonna make like he's singing about an elf is somehow worse than singing yeah. about a <laughs> toilet? <laughs> like very, right? very little elf music in this too. I do think just like Led Zeppelin are to blame for everyone thinking this. Well, also Roger Dean covers still. But there, there's the occasional token reference. There's and, far and more. And also, uh, yeah. the main guy in Yes looks like an elf. Yeah, John It's not Anderson helping elf. things. It seemed like their front man literally was yeah. from the Shire. They kind of stand apart. And, and everyone who worked with John Anderson just appreciates that he wants to write extremely mystical lyrics influenced by Bhagavad Gita. Bahav but there's far, there are far more, more progressive rock songs about the apocalypse than there are about elves. And I, I haven't counted all of them, but I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah, and... When it comes to King Crimson, there's a fair amount of songs about just like sleeping with chicks yeah. <laughs> than you'd think. Like, it's like, man, these guys were sleazier than I thought they were. And then they changed the, some of the lyrics a little bit too. No, they had groupies too. I mean, go look, look up the cover of Love Beach, the ELP album. Uh, I heard some people chuckle already. Like, these were, these were like very uh, forward, you know, gr groupie. Bands that girls yeah. would glom onto, despite all the stereotypes we built, built onto them since then. Yeah. Lake especially. Yeah. The cover of Love Beach, it's on a beach. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the three guys with their shirts kind of buttoned down, right? Showing mm -hmm. off their tough guy uh, chests. Kind of glistening yeah. chests. And uh, yeah, I could picture somebody. And that, unsurprisingly, was kind of the end of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. <laughs> it's like... You picture some kid being like, what? Where's the... He's like, wait, what happened to the classical music? 
But like, the, the album gives you both Love Beach and a 20-minute song about pirates. So it's yeah. it kind of they kind of captured it after after the tour with the with the entire Montreal orchestra. Uh, that is the note they went out on. Yeah. So what what was this cruise the cruise to yeah. the edge you went on, which is a yes themed, yeah. which is a fun play on words for. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised that everybody just didn't start. You guys clearly didn't get the joke of the cruise. It's <laughs> like the cl- album Close to the Edge. It's so you went on this cruise. Yeah, I was cautious because I, I, I really didn't want to write a, a, a many cliches in the book. I mean, I, I wanted to put it, put this music in its context, tell the history, but I didn't want to make fun of it. And it is hard. I, I thought it'd be hard to not make fun of a, pro, a progressive rock cruise. Uh, the owners did it after they realized like heavy metal cruises made money, and I, I, I really liked in reporting this how open everyone were, everyone is about. Well, this is successful, and this this people bought fewer tickets to this, so we're gonna we're gonna lead with uh, we're gonna lead with the, the 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 yes shows instead of the the new thing. But it was a uh, you know four nights and five days across the Caribbean, parking in Mexico, at, and I made sure to go on Mexican expeditions with uh, members of Tangerine Dream and Genesis, um, who were nice, normal people. Um, I did feel like the Edgar from T- Tangerine Dream got really tired of people in fake Mayan dress coming up to try and sell them things. But uh, the fan, just, I think, I, I had never been on a cruise before. A cruise, I guess, where it's just a big, long hotel party on, the, on a boat seems boring. This, from noon to... 2 a.m. and then into the evening when people were going to the one lounge and playing covers of songs, uh, what I I just really felt like buffeted in a good way by how much people devoted their lives to the music, and you know some of them were open about some of them kind of took the freak flag out and would admit uh, on this boat there was a night where you were encouraged to wear your cape for example, mm-hmm. um, okay. it was a little Star Trek convention-y but but with People happily discussing time signatures, different kinds of synthesizers, home recording studios, and that sort of thing. And I just, any kind of obsessive fandom like that, I think is interesting. And yeah. luckily I was like, I wasn't sure what direction the book was going on. That, that cleared it up, yeah. Just being on a boat. Being on a boat. <laughs> 500 other, like bands were playing yeah. on the boat though, right? Bands They're were playing on the boat and then people were lounging. Uh, yes had kind of a VIP section, so we didn't see as much of them. Uh, uh-huh. But everyone else just lounging. There was there was a bar I remember particularly because every drink was made with Campari, that wasn't a popu- very popular bar. But uh, every suite just had a band playing at any given time, and and it, it was a place where members of Gentle Giant would have you know lines of people coming up to meet and take photos with them, uh, and I don't know, it felt really blissful in a way I wasn't expecting. And I, 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 w- with that I realized like okay this is not going to be check out this goofy listicle of of uh, the go- of the weirdest covers this will be this was a a t- completely it, it it is a declined and fun <laughs> fallen for, form of music but it, it it deserved a story and appreciation sure yeah uh i should say also you're going to you will be signing your book i will later and then we can do questions in a couple minutes um what 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 do you feel having gone through this journey uh, where you took the music you liked as a kid yeah. and you lived with it for this long? <laughs> what, how did you come out the other side of this? I, I worried I'd come to hate it, just like you hate anything that you indulge in, uh, you know, cigarettes, ice cream, etc. And I didn't because I, I, so I, any song I'd be writing about or album I'd be writing about, I would be listening just to that while, while I played. Maybe sometimes I'd stop, or I'd take a walk outside and listen to it again. Um, and it kind of ruined me for a lot of other music, because it was, uh, in the music I like now, even the, even the kind of electronic influence stuff, there there is risk, and there are melodic passages it takes you down you're not expecting, and maybe just because of the space of the human memory, a 20 minute song, I'd be surprised each time, if I put it down for a couple of days, something else would surprise me about it. So just the complexity of it, I ended up falling backwards in the process of the book into bands that didn't make bands didn't make it, composers that didn't make it. But it kind of op- for someone who was just a fan who would play stuff in a commute and then learning more music theory to un- learning basically not just how to inter- interview these musicians, but to get new new information out of them about how they wrote it. I was like, okay, I was not wrong in my theory. This is just more interesting than a lot of the music that 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 came all along to replace it. Mm-hmm. And and with the people, yeah, 
did you come away with a with a different a different feeling about certain people uh, having lived with it th- this long, either on a personal basis yeah. of actually talking to them or just really going this deep into their music to tell their story? Uh, well, I learned that the second singer for King Crimson is kind of an anti-Semite, so that changed things. Okay, <laughs> that's. <laughs> but apart from that, everyone I everyone I came out of it with, I mean, just I, well. Well, he's kind of an here, anti-Semite. Come on. <laughs> okay, good. He's not a fool. But no, I, I, I use the, that's the exception that proves the rule. I mean, Steve Wilson uh, from Porcupine Tree kind of ends the book because he came up way after all this, and he's discovering this backwards kind of like I did through Pink Floyd and then finding their stuff, and um, makes an argument that progressive metal is the last interesting thing that is going to happen in, in, in pop music. Uh, and so, but... Talking to these guys about it, it and it, it was good. I would always pitch them and say, uh, I'm not just, look, this is not going to be just a, like a, a bunch of lists or um, let's go over how this album was really cool. I want to get deeper into how you wrote it. And um, some people made, some people did respond to that question. The ones who did, it was, they were very open about what it is like to create music in a genre that everyone abandons. Um, some of them evolve and some of them... Uh, some of them kind of never get out of it, and I learned which. I, I, that's a kind of a dark way to end it. I mean, I don't like. I don't want to narc on people who are very sad that no one comes to the Cape concert anymore. <laughs> but a couple of them, a couple of them. Well, okay. Get. Well, then here's a, a fun, <laughs> nice way. To, what, what's who's somebody who came away feeling the, like like you admire this person yeah. after having told their story? Oh, I think Steve Hackett from Genesis because he's just hyper aware of what what. It, it takes to, to please an audience and what it takes to please him. And just a, a, had a good, a lot of that's in the book. I mean, a lot of the story of him watching this band succeed him, with him from the sidelines and then the music he decided to make that was interesting to him and didn't find the same audience. Like, uh, not just him, but a, b- a bunch of people like that. I mean, the, the level of, of craft, even for people who sold out explaining why they did, like John, like John Wetton and why they disagreed with the term sell out, I just came away appreciating what it takes to be at this level of of of, of like of, of accomplishment and a popularity and then keep 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 changing yeah uh let do you, you want to take some questions yes please are there how's oh you have a mic my okay. young i have a mic right a mic. here so if everyone would let me run the mic to them first hi so what is the artist or album mm-hmm. you've had the most trouble convincing people of its merits? Uh, I'd say Soft Machine Third, unless I know somebody who already likes Miles Davis and likes f- Fusion Jazz, uh, that album, which uh, I, sh- I should note, like, was played at the BBC, they played at the BBC proms with this music, this entirely instrumental, long, ch- uh, really, I think, compelling, but if you're in the wrong frame of mind, atonal music. And I've, that's usually been, the um, uh, the step five, I guess, if the oh, the, kind of the alt right ruin the matrix, I guess. I was gonna make a matrix reference. <laughs> it's not the kung fu part. It's when it shows you like the humans in the uh, tied up for for energy f- for fuel sources. Like people can get into fragile right away, but soft machine. That's when they're like, oh, so there's something wrong with Dave. Neat. I didn't know that before. You could also say the second and third matrix movie didn't help. No. With <laughs> Keeping the before the Nazis the ruined it, yeah. like the Wachowskis so. got there. So. Other questions in the back? Hi. So um, there's a narrative that um, punk rock kind of came and killed this sort of excess. Um, mm-hmm. How does one reconcile that? I say that as a young person who bought into that narrative. Yeah. Um, meaning that this was all excessive, like masturbatory sort of, um, you know, music. And um, how do you reconcile being a punk rock fan and also appreciating the joy that that comes from that um, music? Well. Uh, some of the punks did. I mean, they they were usually kind of subtle. I mean, the Germs quote roundabout in in No God. Uh, I think John Lydon, as soon as he stepped away from Malcolm McLaren, was pretty 
pretty willing to admit that he liked uh, liked some of this this music. But in terms of, I think it's more about appreciating the attitude that was created with. Uh, the, in order for the punk took what was bad and replaced it with good stuff, narrative to be like totally true, this music would have had to have been hollow. And it's not, it's not hollow. These when they were starting out. Uh, these bands had the, 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 both the same age and the same kind of creative mentality, which was what this music around us is really boring. We want to we blow that up and take it a new direction. It just was the direction they took it in was long and experimental. And there's like there's obviously bad stuff. I think there is some 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 wanking in some of the live performances. Uh, also, I feel even more than most genres I've 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 learned about in music, people in progressive rock or like willing to admit that, like Rick Wakeman, I guess, uh, listen to him sort of ex explain what it was like to be in Yes, and the appreciation of both how everyone in that band was trying to do something exciting, and ever and not everyone in the band, just him, was like was aware when they were when exciting it crossed the line into stupid, but it's it's more just the spirit. Like I I want to emphasize that it's the spirit of like of something new and dynamic that I don't think they got credit for. Because if you just start the clock in 1977, you're not seeing how inventive it was when it started. And it's always easy to act superior to somebody wearing a cape. Yeah. <laughs> it's always easy to act like you're better than them. But they wore a cape. They had the guts to put a cape on. <laughs> oh, I wish I was on that cruise ship on the cape night. <laughs> That would have been the highlight of my life. There was a Cape Night photo booth that uh, li <laughs> completely lived up to expectation. Uh, is prog an ethic as well as a musical genre in the way that uh, we talk about non-musical things being punk or hip-hop or metal? Yeah. Uh, if so, what is that ethic? And if not, is that just a uh, misapprehension of what the genre is? You mean like a, like a period of time that you can, you can date? Or when you say epic? No, I mean like, I, you know, I would talk about uh, an event, or I would talk about uh, mm. an aesthetic being, you know, brutal or being metal or being punk or something yeah. like that. Does something like that exist for prog, or is that just not something the, for lack of a better term, prog community is interested in? That's that's a good question because that that's I think what the the aesthetic is what people make fun of, and the aesthetics what a lot of musicians I talk to, really not any of them wanted to call it prog. Wanted to call it prog. They're happy with progressive but they would kind of quibble with what it meant. So it's not the, the same way, it, and I, even when it was, w was popular, like the, pre the bands would, would, it, bands would be okay with the press describing their music as progressive because it meant they were doing much more with rock than people, had, people thought was possible. But there's not really an aesthetic. To the extent that there is, it, it does look a little bit jam bandy. I don't wanna, I think we've like hit the, uh, hit the quota on cape jokes, but it does involve. No, we're oh. still. <laughs> Few more to go. No, but Sorry. there's yeah, but I in going to lots of the shows, it is generally people who are a little bit older than me. It's like T-shirts that you're really impressed if somebody's got one from the '83 tour instead of the '87 tour. It's a lot like the classic rock aesthetics. So it's more when it is an aesthetic, it is the it is how it is played and it's a technique. Um, and the thing that people will embrace about about progressive is just. Our, our, you know, I've been a lot of guys just with garage bands, and their garage band was not just covering the Rolling Stones. Their garage band was trying to write insane, complicated songs that sounded new every time. That's the aesthetic, but it's culturally it was kind of harder to cram in, and like that, and that, that's, that comes that hopefully comes across in the book because even this was happening when there were very clear aesthetics in British music too, like Teddy Boys and <laughs> Greasers, and uh, and then punk coming on. Progressive, because I think because it was so mass popular, it didn't have that. It was just people wore what they wore, what they wore to everything else to shows, and they get a T-shirt afterward. Anyone yeah, uh, raise your hand? Yeah. Speaking of the popularity, yeah. um, do you consider the time of that music's greatest popularity to be more an example of, like, the public's acceptance of of an avant-garde in music, or do you see yeah. it more as like a cheeseburgerfication of their influences? <laughs> uh, I, I like that. I like that question a lot. I think the what came up in in reporting, and especially talking to people who were in like AR and radio, uh, was it it was the music was not getting cheeseburgerified, or it wasn't bland. It wasn't it wasn't bland. It was honestly there just was more time the public had to invest in these in, in like album radio 
and concert. People go to festivals and all that stuff. I'm, it, like, the festival culture is, has, is probably bigger than ever. But concerts as like beans uh, and concerts as concerts as a, as a mass happening. There just was more of that. There was more before more distractions came in culturally is what people ended up coming around to, um, and so that's I think that's part. Your your the first part of your question that that's embedded in that that people were less distracted and more more interested in finding just the new weird music, the the band that didn't sound sound like everyone else. Than I, I I think there is now when everything is, I mean, for the record industry has kind of been slaughtered by online, online, taste making. Um, it just it, there was more openness because there was less to do, and I'm not, that's like I, every time I say that I feel like I'm giving them giving the bands less credit for being really good and being popular, but that's what people you know. The, as I talked to radio, uh, it was a lot of radio people. I was wondering why this why this was. I, 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 it doesn't feel like our, our cues got lower that since then. It was just our distractibility got higher. Yeah, how about that guy? Um, is technical prowess yeah. absolutely a, a totally necessary? Because people always talk Pink Floyd mm -hmm. on the edges of Prague, and like, I don't think Pink Floyd uh, could play that much. Yeah. <laughs> So well, then, this yeah. and 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 Gong too. I mean, Steve Hillage's Gong was really he he was he was a unique talent. Um, but some avenues that progressive rock went down was more just psychedelia's next step. Uh, and with Pink Pink Floyd, kind of kind of did that. I think we're one prong of what happened with psych psychedelia. Some of these bands were other. So you, it, it's more technical proficiency is less important than if you were just bending rock to, to do new things with it. And Pink Floyd are certainly doing that. Like the sonic experimentation uh, that Alan Parsons would add to the production, the sounds that are not musical sounds, so, you know, not being played by instruments, but are being overlaid over. That's not, that's not something that takes lots of years of training to do. And I think that that still fits within it. But that's a, that's a good question. Because yeah, there are some bands that are not famous for their solos, but clearly were popular in this genre. And there are bands like Griffin that were just playing like Renaissance style music, but they were doing it in rock forms. So it didn't take a, a, a crazy amount of talent and they weren't soloing a lot. They're just, all right, there's rock that we're bored with that. Henry Cow would be another I don't think are incredibly, you, you don't listen to like Henry Cow guitar solo. They're just doing this kind of anti-rock <laughs> by reversing what you're expecting from the music. And, and like Hawkwind. Hawk yeah, Hawkwind is just riff rock, basically. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think, I know people want to say that's space rock, <laughs> but then you get to a point, it's like, why do we have to categorize literally everything? Can it just be music that we like, <laughs> right, everyone? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, but, that, but that's fun, though. People like categorizing their, 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 their collection. That's the kind of anorak. Marillion definitely took advantage of, the, of like the super fan, because Marill Marillion, I give a lot of credit, and no one has proved me wrong for like st basically starting Kickstarters as a thing artists could do. Uh, and they relied on like the obsessive fans who were who were cate they'd categorize the music, but then uh, the band might quibble. But it was kind of fun to riff them. It's like just like with baseball, comparing comparing the best players of all time or ranking if, if some guy can be uh, counted because he's in the steroid era and some guy isn't. I mean, the fandom is a really big part of this in a way that uh, I think was super important to the book. Do you care who is and isn't prog? I don't really. I mean, I. I kind of would vet it with like, mm -hmm. some musicians I talked to. If they had a real problem with mm -hmm. being included in the genre, I would include that caveat. Mm -hmm. But no, it's it is a really broad label. I mean, it's uh, and you know, I've seen punk be applied super broadly sure. to certain stuff. New wave is applied so broadly, like it barely makes sense. It's such a small step when yeah. you think of kraut rock being in the discussion. Yeah, then it's just like anything is prog rock, right? <laughs> Literally anything is <laughs> prog. No, I mean. There's ABBA songs that are close to prog rock. There are, trust me. Who else has question there? Yeah, I, I like that that got applause. I agree. Yes. Yeah. It's mine. Hey, um, so getting to, uh, getting to the question, I, I've been a fan of Rush for years, and I've yeah. always, I've always, sorry, sorry, Tom. Um, 
I've been a fan of theirs for years, and despite the fact, <laughs> despite the fact that I've uh, never considered myself a libertarian, I always hear them referred to as this libertarian rock band. <laughs> uh, did you, Dave, I know you yeah. are a political reporter. Have you ever seen any sort of, uh, is this some political threads or political uh, trends in the prog community or among the musicians or anything yeah. like that? Uh, not a ton. It's pretty utopian is the main thing. Uh, especially in the 70s, the bands, the, the, like there was a political aesthetic it was that we better not let like the planet get nuked or polluted to death. And with Rush, um, n a lot of the pol political analysis comes just from Neil Peart's lyrics for a certain period of time, which is immortalized. I, the, like one interview with some of these people, with one of these guys I quote at length is Neil Peart with this NME interview where the guy just w would not let him go. Uh, by the next time at the Rush came to England, they were abandoning that. But they still had free will in a few songs uh, that libertarians adopt. But they've made it very clear <laughs> to libertarians they don't want them to do it. To the extent where, uh, you know, they asked Rand Paul not to use free will as a campaign song. <laughs> and I asked him at a, like, in a kind of, ha like, ah, the, by the way, Rush don't like you very much. He got furious. He got more furious. <laughs> Than, than I've ever seen somebody I've covered for years, <laughs> but heartbroken that Rush would not go along with with the libertarian agenda and they're rejecting that fandom. It's like, I just think it's really small-minded. Uh, but no, like, uh, also I discover that Roger Dean is like a, not a climate change, he's a climate change skeptic. He's like a Brett Stevens, which surprised me. But there's not, this is, I think it's so escapist that it's hard to find a lot of, a lot of politics in it. He just wants us to be on a, Planet with dripping things. I think that's it. The faster we down, the faster we just be like. I <laughs> saw it in '74. I knew this was going to happen. The faster we destroy Earth, the sooner we get to the relayer planet. <laughs> Real. A few more questions. Another so, rush. coming from the heavy metal community, yeah. moving into Prague, uh, do you think it's safe to say that with the the big elements of? Um, really bombastic music, trying to push yourself to the next level. Do you think that the heavy metal that came along just a few years after Prague went out was maybe not the musical or the aesthetic continuation, but kind of the social continuation yeah. of the Prague movement? Yeah, the way you ended that, I think, is completely right. I mean, especially, I would not recommend everyone do what I did and read every British mu music magazine for <laughs> 20 years, but it's very clear that's what was happening. With there, there was just a a like working and middle class community that wanted to go to concerts, and they couldn't fit into the small Sex Pistols concert. Like you see this in the in the in the way it was written in Enemy and Sounds and stuff. That especially the year end polls in like 1978, people are still saying in the in the like year of the of of adverts and stuff that their favorite keyboard player is Rick, Rick Wakeman. So. As these bands kind of, and they, they all kind of broke at the same time, which is useful for book writing, it definitely was those same fans that were flooding into this. And then when, when Marillion come around in 1982, there's very funny, arch, pissy reviews in the British press where they're looking around. These are clearly the guys who are like the Iron Maiden shows. And there's this dread, like, oh, are we going to have to do this again? <laughs> like, if all these people are, get, are into progressive rock again, what's going to happen? Uh, so yeah, it, was, it was a lot of the same. And it's, it's kind of like, it's not outsider. It, it, it is popular. It is more popular than I think uh, that than than punk was. But no, this, the, there was a definite transfer of the community. I think that's why the progressive metal made so much made so much sense. And there's been so much cross pollination since then. Okay. Two more questions. Right there. Sure. Hi. You mentioned Tales from Topographic Oceans yes. as an album that you would defend. Uh, that's uh, interesting to me. I was yeah. wondering if I could hear your defense of it. <laughs> <laughs> or just if you want to wax poetic about it or something. Uh, I think the bass line is so low that it's easy to, def easy to defend something like, li like that. I think the, there are big, boring spots on it, but moments just where the band was, like, was cracking it away it never did again, and out of, out of like pomp and overconfidence, uh, but I can appreciate it more when I noticed that that hip that it was sampled in hip hop more than any other Yes album, because there are just really spa parts where John Anderson's harmonies kind of merge with the synthesizers, long drum sections that that make that that like seem to drag if you're if you're kind of waiting for something to happen, but they're actually kind of hypnotic. It's but like by no means the best Yes album, although I've met people who think it is, and and God bless them. But it's just it's it, I like it. Be, I, I, the problem with it at the time was that they played the entire. This is, I think everyone here seems probably is probably familiar with it, but it is two LPs, two you know four sides, four songs. 
Um, so each song is 20 minutes long, and they played it at first, just each concert was only that album. You would go to see Yes, they would play this album, then the curtain would come down, you would go home. And that's what, people got really sour on it, but I feel, I what? feel like... What? They didn't like that? Everything that, <laughs> everything that was good and close to the edge, there are parts of it in there, and parts that got way weirder, but then because people rejected so much, they, they backed off. And, and again, Rick, Rick Wingman's hatred, hatred for things is contagious. So I think he also turned people against it by being so bored that he just kept ordering meals while they were trying to play the guitar solo. All right. Oh, Was there uh, one, one We got one more over there. Was that? Yeah. Oh, I thought, look, you don't have to have a question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, oh, we do. Okay. Yes. Fine. Uh, quick question. Uh, what is your favorite and least favorite Prague album cover? Oh, album cover? Uh, I think, so, Hypnosis were the, uh, were, like, they're, they're the, the two defining designers of all this stuff are, uh, Roger Dean, it's a, always kind of same spacey cover, and Hypnosis, who were kind of clip, would merge different pieces of art together with new art, so I think, even though I really like going for the one, uh, goes a little bit too far for me, and just being a naked guy looking at a skyscape with lasers, uh, and the, now that I've described it, it sounds amazing. <laughs> um, and the, be the best, I'd say, I actually am really fond of, once King Crimson went super minimal, and like this, the, the, the mandala on discipline, I just think is uh, on its own really gorgeous and wrapped around something, just red vinyl with that on it. That's probably like my favorite of these objects to hold. But man, no, you're realizing, there are p points when I was writing this book where I, I, I really wanted to just put everything in a list <laughs> like like that so I'm gonna I, I need to go flip through uh, well realistically flip through like the tiny I just started this by talking about the cassettes and how unimpressive it was to look at album cover and cassettes and now I will go back to my phone with an even smaller image of these covers <laughs> and shuffle them to see if I missed anything I can I'm not gonna say you this is your night you're completely wrong okay it's a one word answer Tarkus it's a Best militarized worst. armadillo. How can you pass up on that? That's the greatest thing that's ever happened in anything. <laughs> An armadillo with weapons. <laughs> with and if you with, fold, if you unfold it, all the other characters in the Tarkus yeah. saga, like the Aqua Tarkus <laughs> and the Griffin. I think we gotta go pitch Tarkus to Michael Bay. <laughs> There was a, if there was a battleship movie, there could be a Tarkus movie. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, well, I got to say, your book is fantastic. It was, I'm so excited you did what you did, and I'm so glad you wrote the book you wrote because it's fantastic, and it's, it's a great document of something that is under-documented. So thank you for the book, David, and uh, everybody can get it signed by him now. All right, thank you.